There are several methods available for reducing a carboxylic acid to an alcohol or an amide to an amine. The one that's most commonly taught in academic settings uses lithium aluminium hydride, lithal for short, and although it's a well-established method dating back to the 1940s, it has two major practical drawbacks. The first is that lithal itself is pyrophoric with water in powder form, so contact with water can make it spontaneously catch fire. And the second is that its reactions are highly exothermic, generate a lot of hydrogen gas, and are often used in conjunction with flammable organic solvents that draw water from the air. For those reasons, it's an enormous fire hazard, and it's not generally used in industry. Besides all that, another disadvantage for amateurs is that because of its hazards, it's eye-wateringly expensive. The only place in Europe that publicly sells it to amateurs retails it at €113 Euros for 25 grams, €284 Euros for 100 grams, or €1,217 Euros for 1 kilo. For context, that last figure equates to just over three months' worth of mortgage payments on my house. In 1973, an alternative method for carboxylic acid reduction was published using borane as the reducing agent. Although borane is highly flammable in air, it forms stable complexes with THF and dimethyl sulfide, and these are easier to handle than lithal, though they still need a lot of buggering about with syringes and rubber seals. It was first reported in 1965 that borane could be generated in situ from sodium borohydride and iodine in an ether solvent. And at some point after 1973, this method was applied to carboxylic acid reductions. I've not yet been able to find its first reported usage. While the starting materials were easier to handle than borane THF or borane dihymethyl sulfide, the reactions still required an inert atmosphere and the end results could be messy. Which finally brings us to the main focus of this video. In 1991, Anthony Periasami, working at the University of Hyderabad in India, published a paper in the Journal of Organic Chemistry that described a subtle but highly effective improvement to the borohydride iodine method that allowed for a much wider range of compounds to be reduced than previously reported. For instance, molecules with more than one carboxylic acid group, like adipic and azelaic acids, for which a traditional borane reduction would fail instead resulting in polymerization. The refinement consisted of reacting the acid with sodium borohydride, again in THF, to form an acetoxy borohydride salt, which is stable in air, and then adding iodine to that salt, which is much more reactive than borohydride itself, to remove the carbonyl oxygen, forming a bar on ether of some kind and liberating hydrogen. The exact nature of the intermediates is not at all clear. Generally speaking, as far as organic chemistry is concerned, if the method works reliably, no one really gives a toss about what the intermediates look like. In the workup, aqueous acid is added to hydrolyze the boron ether to the free alcohol. So in summary, the constituent stages of the reduction were separated into two individual steps, as opposed to the previous general approach of just throwing everything together in one pot, boiling it up and hoping for the best. The most remarkable aspect of this method is that no free boring is formed during the reduction, meaning that the whole procedure can be done with no need for an inert atmosphere. This, of course, makes it much easier for large-scale chemical manufacturers and amateur chemists alike to carry out. I'm a huge fan of obscure but highly practical methods like this, so I decided to carry it out. I'll spoil the ending for you right now. It does actually work. If it didn't, I'd not have made such a long video about it. The reagents used were THF, alumina, three angstrom molecular sieves, salicylic acid, sodium borohydride, iodine, hydrochloric acid, caustic soda, sodium thiosulfate, and diisopropyl ether. Although this method is very practical, you cannot take shortcuts with it. It's not air sensitive, but in the early stages, water is its ultimate nemesis. 
At best, water will reduce your yields and at worst it will destroy the key intermediate and you'll end up with next to nothing. So the first thing to do is dry your THF, which basically acts as a magnet for water. Distilling it over 10% by weight by volume alumina up to 24 hours prior to use and storing it over molecular sieves is the safest and most effective way to do this. The traditional method of using metallic sodium is not actually that effective. The disposal of unreactive sodium is pretty hazardous and it's just not worth the graft involved. This is a result proved by an actual scientific paper which can also be found in the description. Alumina within train water tends to stick to the walls of the flask making it difficult to clean. These residues can be shifted with concentrated sulfuric acid and some heating. So before starting the reaction itself it's essential to flame dry your glassware to remove any residual water. Sodium borohydride was ground to a fine powder using a pestle and mortar and added to a flame dried 250ml round bottom flask, followed promptly by 40ml of dry THF. The grinding is extremely important because sodium borohydride is not soluble in THF and coarse particles result in an incomplete reaction. Salicylic acid was dissolved in 40ml dry THF and slowly added to the mixture via an addition funnel which caused a lot of effervescence as hydrogen was evolved and caused the mixture to warm slightly. The mixture was stirred until no more gas was evolved which was about 15 minutes. It was left to stir for a further 15 minutes just to be on the safe side. Reaction product, an acetoxy borohydride salt of some kind, is soluble in THF but poorly so making the mixture turbid. Iodine was dissolved in dry THF and slowly added to the mixture, again via an addition funnel. Gloves are essential for this step. Iodine is not particularly toxic or corrosive, but when it's dissolved in organic solvents, it stains everything and it's hard to remove. Prevention is better than cure. Now, if you've cocked up any of the prior steps, in particular not drying your glassware properly, using your THF much more than a day or two after drying it, or not grinding your sodium borohydride, it's at this point that you'll find out. Instead of the iodine colour fading quickly as it did here, it will start fading more slowly, long before the whole lot has been added, and will eventually not fade away at all because it has nothing left to react with. It's not a strong enough oxidising agent to react with borohydride at room temperature. Once all the iodine was added, the mixture was left to stir for another two hours, then quenched with 10% aqueous hydrochloric acid, which produces more effervescence and a load of precipitation, which is most likely inorganic boron compounds. The mixture, which quickly becomes yellow and then orange, was then filtered by gravity into a separating funnel. At this point, the workup in the original paper has an element that's a bit nonsensical. The paper states that the reaction mixture was extracted with ether, presumably diether ether, but that mixes freely with THF, meaning there's no phase separation. As per the author's later papers concerning the application of this reaction to other functional groups don't include this step, this is almost certainly a drafting error. Instead, as per the later papers, the mixture was extracted with 15% caustic soda, which was about 50 grams in 3 or 4 portions. Separation between the two phases is poor until the acid is neutralised. Because the intended product contains a phenol group, which is deprotonated above about pH 10, the aqueous extract was acidified with concentrated hydrochloric acid, causing a large amount of insoluble material to precipitate out. The acidified aqueous extract was then extracted with diisopropyl ether, which dissolved the material. Incidentally, around my way, diisopropyl ether is a major component of engine starter fluids, so while this step was being carried out, the lab smelt much like a commercial garage. The very orange ether extracts were extracted with 5% sodium thiosulfate, removing any unreacted iodine and brine, which in theory removes water, but in this case it didn't work too well, so the extracts were dried using anhydrous magnesium sulfate and a filter by gravity into a round bottom flask, ready for solvent removal by distillation. And this is the point where things started going tits up.
Originally, I intended to remove the solvent by vacuum distillation, and as soon as the vacuum was applied, the mixture started boiling vigorously at ambient temperature, with constant bubbling. At first, I was under the impression that the solvent was boiling, but soon discovered that instead, the product itself was sublimating and recondensing on the inner surfaces of the apparatus. As I don't have the necessary setup for a vacuum sublimation, I washed out the condensed product with diisopropyl ether and conducted the distillation at ambient pressure instead. The initially colourless ether extract turned yellow with heat and turned red as it got more concentrated. Also, the distillate became pale yellow, suggesting some of the product was going over with it. I stopped distillation when I saw some pale yellow oil condensing out the top of the flask. The reddish residue at the base, which became mostly solid at room temperature, was transferred to a beaker and I did a crude kind of recrystallisation from industrial methylated spirits and water. On cooling, this produced a yellow solid product, which was dried on the pump for an hour, with a bit of water washing, producing a very colourful filter paper and removing the vast majority of residual solvent. The end result was 0.9 grams of a pale peach coloured coarse free flowing solid, representing an overall yield of 36%, which is very poor given the general track record of this procedure. As I said, I suspect a lot of the product co distilled with the solvent. Nonetheless, it shows the procedure does actually work. The problem here was that my extraction techniques were not appropriate for the end product. It's quite telling that salicylic alcohol is not widely available other than through TCI, ligma, aldrich and the like. It's quite expensive and there's little widely available physical data about it. Turns out it's actually a very slippery customer. If I were to repeat the procedure, I would use vacuum sublimation to isolate it. Also, when this reaction is done with amino acids or anything else that results in water-soluble products, a substantially different experimental procedure is needed. I'm in the process of making a separate video about that because God only knows this one's long enough already. But until my next release, whether that's part two of this reaction or something else, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching.